So there is a very prolific math crank called John Gabriel. He, uh, well, you'll see based on his attitude, but he basically thinks that he is the the greatest mathematician since Euclid, probably, I think. <clears throat> and everything between him and Euclid, everybody who has come between him and Euclid does not understand math. And basically, a lot of the stuff he says just doesn't make any sense. And recently he started a short YouTube series about um, ZFC, the nine axioms, where he debunks every single axiom. What that means is will become apparent in a second. Uh, <coughs> I think the videos are really funny, and I'm gonna talk about them a little bit. Before I start that, I should mention I'm not a mathematician, I'm an undergrad math student. I have not had classes in set theory. All my knowledge about set theory comes from brief talks with Kinada and about half of this book, uh, Introduction to uh, Set Theory, Introduction to Independence Proofs, I think it's called. Studies and Logic and the Foundations of Mathematics, apparently. Set, yeah, Set Theory and Introduction to Independence Proofs by Kunan. Um, so, don't take the things that I say for true either. I could very well be wrong about a lot of stuff I'm saying. So with that said, <coughs> way I'm going to do this is I'm going to go um, through the videos one by one. And I'm going to first explain what your axiom actually says before I start the video. And start the video after that. So first he starts with the axiom of the axiom of extensionality. Extensionality basically says that if that if two sets have the same elements, exactly the same elements, then they're the same set. Where the other direction is implied by what equal means. Um, this is formalized as for every y, for every x, the following holds, and the following being for every z, um, if z is an x, if and only if z is an y, if, that, if this holds, then x is equal to y. So if this holds for every z, for every z, then x is equal to y. This is just just like syntactically written down, but two elements having the same sets means that two sets having the same elements means that for every element, the element is in one set if and only if it's the other set. And this also brings me to probably. Sh I should probably say that ZFC, ZFC or ZF or whatever, only talks about sets. Every object is a set, and every set can be an element of another set. Okay, with that, let's go. Greetings, and welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel, and I'm going to diverge for a short while from my main series called What Your Ignorant Teachers Could Not Tell You to present a series of videos on the zermelo Franco axioms. And they're called axioms, but they're actually beliefs. He talks about this a bit where he makes a difference between axioms and beliefs. I don't take issue with calling them beliefs. Um, he talks a bit about philosophy of mathematics in general. I'm not going to be opposing him much there. I don't. I don't think I'm qualified to talk. Qualified to talk about philosophy of mathematics, and I also don't care that much. And in this first uh, video, I'm going to discuss, <coughs> excuse me, belief one, or what they think of as axiom one. Now, Zermelo and Frankel were pretty much 
below average mathematicians and they came long before the group of those 40 French morons who called themselves Bourbaki and used their nonsense to formulate the foundations of modern mathematics. So what does the first belief say? It's called the belief of extensionality. Before I go on, I should explain that for some reason on his slides or whatever, um, equivalence is written like this with the three, like the congruence sign with three lines. I haven't ever seen it written like that. I don't know where I got, where I got this from. I, this could just be me being ignorant about notational conventions. I just haven't seen this before. It says, <coughs> excuse me, it says, if x and y have the same elements, then x equals to y. And what you see right in the middle of the page there is the statement written in what's called FOL, or first order logic. And I don't call it FOL or FOL, I call it FOOL, because frankly, neither set nor element nor object nor any of the information that you're given has been defined beforehand. Now, let me read what this statement means for you. And this is what it means. It says, for all u, if u is a part of x and u is a part of y, then x equals to y. So, the way he says this doesn't make sense. He's reading this sign as an and sign, and that confused me at first because that, like, clearly just isn't isn't a thing. For all, if for all you, um, you is part of x and you is part of y, then that would that would mean that uh, x and y are both universal sets because they have every element in it. But later he always uses this as equivalence, and he's gonna say something now that makes it seem like he thinks that too. Or another way to read it is, for all u, if u is a part of x, uh, if u is a part of x, it is equivalent to u being a part of y. Yeah, and then if you understand it like that, and if you assume that he also understands it like that, then he does understand that axiom, or then you would think he understands the axiom correctly. Therefore, x is equal to y. Now, you know, uh, over 2,300 years ago, in that famous book called The Elements, we have something called the common notion, and there are a few of them. But the first one says, Tato afto isa ke alilus estin isa. Okay, what does that mean? That simply means that objects equal to the same thing are also equal to one another. And, wait. It's pretty simple, isn't it? Well, now let me show you how this first belief is broken in so many ways. So, the thing he says that things, objects equals to the same thing, object are also equal to one another, is basically just the transitivity of equality. It's I think I think it's technically there's there are technically things about it being weaker than transitivity or something, but I don't definitely essentially this is basically transitivity of equality. And you only actually get transitivity like this just this thing, as far as I know, is weaker than transitivity, but once you have the other properties of equality it is just transitivity. And transitivity is nothing that belief of extensionality uh, has to do with. Transitivity of equality is established before belief of exten before extensionality even makes sense to talk about. By the way, you may object to this. Although, don't quote me on that thing that I just said about this being weaker than transitivity. It's just something I read somewhere. If then, but it's exactly true. Uh, this if-then 
is what this statement here means. The if then is what the statement means. The, the, the and part just isn't. So <clears throat> let's look at the next slide. <clears throat> if we go to a place like MathWorld, you'll see it has some preliminary definitions, and you have to. Well, apparently he got the the sign. That's where he got the sign from. I'm not so sure about this site, MathWorld. I think MathWorld has a lot of. I'm not, I'm not going to say anything. Believe in all these things, okay? That upside down A means for all. This funny E here means. It's not a funny E, it's a funny epsilon. Means is an element of, and this right arrow here means implies or suggests. Of course, in the nine beliefs, because there are nine of them, uh, this is an element of changes its meaning to minimal element in. This. Epsilon minimal element thing is actually a fairly complicated thing that I get to when we are at the eighth axiom. The belief or axiom of foundation. So the first belief suggests that if for any part u, u is part of some object x and another object y, then x and y are the same objects. Again, that's not what that says. It says that if the same use are in X as in Y and the same use are not in X as in Y, then they're the same object. Not that. So this statement, could, the statement the way it's said here, could be read in two ways. First is the one I explained earlier, where every U has to be in X and Y, and then X and Y are just both universal sets. Uh, the other way to read this is that if there's some u that's in both x and y, then x are the same object. But obviously, if there's some u that is in both x and y, that just means that x and y have non-empty intersection, and not that they're the same. So, in formal set theory, neither element nor set are defined. That is... That's technically a philosophy question, I think. But it's, I don't disagree with that. You don't explicitly define what a set is or what an element is. You define uh, relations. You define the membership relation, the equality relation. You do, um, and then, well, you don't, no, you don't define the relation. You have, you have a relation, the membership relation, and you have equality. And then you basically just, like, the axioms just tell you what like you can do with basically you could the DFC tells you what you can do with those relations you are expected to believe together with like the quantifiers that these objects exist you are you can want to believe that these objects exist if you mean exist in any specific way but again that's philosophy for all U is a deception because it assumes the parts of the objects are all distinct and known beforehand. It is impossible to check all the infinitely many U parts. Okay. That is nonsensical. First off, it hasn't been established yet that there are infinitely many U. All the thing all that's been established is that if every U is an x, if not only if it's in y, then x and y are the same. This is irrelevant of whether there are infinitely many u or finitely many u. Uh, I can take the two sets, uh, fucking whatever, 1, 2, 3, and 1, 2, 4, and then say, and I can say, like, they're both subsets of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and I can say, for all u in 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Obviously, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is not a model of ZFC, but 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 is a model of just extensionality, I guess. Well, yeah, sure. Let's just say there are, there are definitely finite models of 
just having extensionality, trivially, sort of. Just take, take any transitive set, just take like any finite ordinal, ordinal and you have, a, you have a, a model of extensionality. Okay, so somebody might say, oh, the axiom of infinity or the belief of infinity is not needed in ZFC. Oh yeah, and regardless of, wait, let me go back. Um, the, the infinitely many part is also not the only one part about this. Um, for all you is the deception because it assumes the parts of the objects are all distinct. Um, I don't I don't know where he he gets that from, but you do. Um, I don't really know what that means. I don't know what he means with the parts of the objects are distinct. Uh, he might he may or may not be talking about that, like uh, the set one two three. The set containing one and two and three and three is the same set as the set containing one and two and three. I'm not sure if that's what he means. But the one important part is um, and known beforehand. That part is wrong. You don't have to. You don't have to be able to point at a specific set to talk about for all sets. I don't have to know which objects are. Or I don't need to know exactly what a set look li looks like to talk about all the objects in the set. I can have like non-definable sets that and I can still just use the quantifier over that. And he just kinda makes this up. He doesn't really give an explanation for that. But that part's just wrong. Many U parts. Okay, so somebody might say, oh the axiom of infinity or the belief of infinity is not needed in ZFC. It is. <laughs> it's needed from the very first errant belief. Again, no, this has nothing to do with infinity. For all just means, well, technically it means not there exists um, an element such that for all u phi means not there exists a z such that not phi, basically. Um, but the, the dual semantic interpretation that you give it is that it applies for phi applies for all u or all z or whatever and that has nothing to do with whether or not they're infinitely many the belief that <clears throat> uh, we have extensionality and we'll see now a little bit more of what again what does this have to do with, with Extensionality, because there's a fall in the in the formulation of extensionality. Means, okay. So, for certain parts, U is probably what the orangutan morons meant. In other words, a set of U parts. Hmm. No, that's not what's meant. They meant if for every set U, U is an X if and only if it's in Y, then they're the same. If for certain parts you that was the case, then again that just means that they have non empty intersection. Circularity is the key feature of set theory. I'm not sure where he got circularity from here. Uh I think circularity is again a philosophical uh, criticism that some people give set theory. And again, I'm not going to talk about that because I don't feel qualified to. So circular reasoning works because, <coughs> excuse me, circular reasoning works. Mm. I see. <coughs> I don't know where I got that from there specifically. Why is it called the belief of extensionality? I suppose that the syphilitic retards known as a Bourbaki group imagined that objects are equal by extension. However, what I don't know what that means. These highly stupid academics overlooked is the fact that it is never possible to distinguish between an element and a set for both of these parts can be parts or holes. So again, I don't I don't understand what this has to do with extensionality. And again, um, 
everything that ZFC talks about is a set. It doesn't distinguish between elements and sets. There are set theories that have elements that cannot be sets and set-like objects that cannot be elements. Oh well, yeah, sure. But yes, ZFC only talk cannot distinguish between sets and non-sets. Everything that ZFC can talk about is a set. But I don't think why that problem for anything, especially not for extensionality. That should be or holes, not and holes. Or both, actually. <laughs> Choose whatever you want. Now, if you accept any of this rot known as ZFC to be well-formed knowledge, then you are incorrigibly stupid, and there is no hope for <laughs> you. You will be a moron for the rest of your life. Oh, I love him. Join me again in the next exciting episode for Exposition of Belief 2. Now, here is a subset of all the fine morons who formed the Bourbaki group in France. Will died, I think, last year, August the 6th, at 92. Isn't it ironic how the dumbest <laughs> get to live the longest? Hmm. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little presentation and that you will definitely join me again in oh, I will join you again. Exciting episode where I will discuss belief or action too. This is a new calculus channel. I'm John. All right, let's go to the next one. To uh, is it? I mean, I'm assuming it's pairing, right? It says foundations to convention scheme pairing. I think he, I think he has pairing next. Let me just check. It actually Welcome is pairing. Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. In this particular video, I'll be discussing the second in the series of uh, ZFC axioms or beliefs, and I'll be discussing belief two in this video. And I've treated this topic a lot in the past, but I'd like to treat these so-called axioms one at a time so that you can get a better understanding okay mm -hmm. let's okay. begin now uh if you remember uh the first uh so-called action was the action of extensionality which says that uh if an object is equal to another object um if two objects are equal to another object, then they must be the same object, right? No, that's not at all what that's not at all what extensionality says. Okay, so as I just explained. Okay, yeah, pairing. So, um, pairing says that for every when when you have two sets x and y, then you can make the set that contains x and y. Uh, the way it's written here with pairing is that you can make a set that contains x and y and maybe something else um, but because in this list comprehension is earlier and comprehension lets you make subsets with uh, formulas formulae uh, that's basically the same as saying well yeah it's, it's the same as saying that there's a set that has exactly x and y in it so basically you can make, just get a paint. When you have X and Y, then you can make the set that contains X and Y. That is what pairing says. In this second belief, it's not really an action, it's a belief, and it's garbage. It says that for any A and B, it doesn't even, states, doesn't even state what A and B are. Yes, it doesn't state that because it doesn't concern itself with what they are supposed to be. They are the things that the ZFC talks about, and the things that ZFC talks about is what we call sets.
because there is no formal definition of set. Yes, there is no formal definition of set other than CFC gives no formal definition of set other than well, this is other than what we describe as set, which is the things that CFC talks about. It says there exists a set A and B that contains exactly A and B, and as you can see over here, again he has a union here. This is supposed to be or. So the way this is read is, did I read this out properly? Yeah, okay, so, so the way it's written here is that um, X is in Z and Y is in Z. The way it's written here is, uh, for, all a and, for all sets A and B, there exists a set C such that for a, wow, suddenly went into German, Jesus. For every element X and C, uh, oh no, for every element X, X is in C if and only if X is A or X and B. One direction implies either of the set inclusions. This is the way it's written in first old logic, <clears throat> and it's read as for any A and for any B there is a C, so that for all X, if X is an element of C, this is equivalent to saying that X is either equal to A or it's equal to B. Yep. Now, if one were to allow oneself to imagine the set of real numbers, there is no such set. But let's just hypothetically assume... John Gabriel really fucking hates this, hates the set of real numbers. Like, he he does not like real numbers. Uh, I'm not going to go into that now. He's going to talk about that in his video about choice. I'm going to go more into it there that it exists and also that its power set exists and this belief certainly becomes quite interesting because how do you create a third set from the set of real numbers and its power set and of course that's where George Cantor the father of again what do you mean you take you take the set of real numbers and you take the power set of real numbers and then you make the set that contains them both there you go that's how you do it that's what pairing says that's what pairing says you can do when you have the set of real numbers and its power set then you can make a set that contains the set of real numbers and the power set of real numbers that's all there is to it well mathematical cranks come how do you create a third set from the set of real numbers and its power set? And of course, that's where George Cantor, the father of all mathematical cranks, comes in with his different levels of infinity, etc. So that has nothing to do with different levels of infinity. Pairing just tells you that when you have two sets, you can make one set of which the elements are exactly these two sets. Um, you're always somehow able to create a third set, but this this axiom is fundamentally false. Why? Uh, especially in terms of the fact that there is no such set as real numbers. And this, uh, this doesn't even talk about real numbers. But whether or not there's a set of real numbers doesn't affect pairing. Pairing does not need the real numbers. And if there were, then there would be no third set with real numbers and its power set. Yes, there would be. That's exactly what it says. You just take the set and you put the real numbers in, and then you put the power set in. Okay, so it's quite strange because there is no reason to believe that if any two sets are well defined, there should not be a third set containing exactly the same, right? Whether, the, again, whether or not, well, there is a reason to believe it. I, you can, like, imagine that that could be the case. Whether or not pairing makes sense, whether or not pairing is like something that should be in set theory is once again a philosophical question. But the morons who designed set theory wanted a cover your arse belief. <laughs> so that they could produce more bullshit about sets whose elements or sets they may not be able to clarify or clearly identify all the elements. For example... Again, what does pairing have to do with that? The set of real numbers. Uh, you can, you cannot identify all the elements of that fictitious set because. Sure, not every real number is definable. That still has nothing to do with pair with pairing. 
you simply can't identify them, right? So they aren't distinct. There, there is no distinct uh, set of real numbers. So Still nothing to do with pairing. So they wanted to create bogus infinite sets by pairing. So that Pairing does not give you infinite sets either. They could start off with uh, an imaginary empty set, which they symbolize like... You don't, you don't, from just, from just having extensionality and pairing, you do not get the empty set. Like that, and then use it as an element. Of course, only the gods know what such a set looks like, because to include it as, a, as an element, one requires the belief that it exists. That is... Okay, so, once we accept that the empty set exists, which we shouldn't yet, because we only have pairing and, and extensionality, and extensionality just says that if two th sets have the same elements, then they're the same, and pairing says that if you have two sets, you can make a set that contains them both which doesn't really say anything about whether or not there's an empty set. But yes, once you have the empty set, you can use pairing to create finite ordinals. You can take the empty set, and then you can use pairing on that to create the set that contains the empty set. And then you can use pairing on that and the empty set to make the set that contains the empty set, and the set that contains the empty set. And then you can use like that and the empty the pairing on that on the empty set, to make the set that contains the empty set and the set that contains the empty set and so on probably probably I'm not entirely sure that you don't need more for that but it seems seems fine I can check if you need more So once you have this, pairing union, placement, this is really a The other, I don't know if he even defines the the ordinals the classical way. Okay. Does he define a successor function? Uses union for that. I don't know. Maybe maybe you need more than pairing. Maybe you do. Maybe you do need more than pairing to get all ordinals because you can. You can get if if you like more than pairing in the empty set. If you have the empty set, you can make the set contain the empty set, which is like the it's just like usually called one, and you can make the set contains the empty set and one, which is usually called two. But then I guess you might not be able to make three, which contains three elements. Because pairing doesn't easily give you things with three elements. Sure. Maybe whether or not isn't really relevant because even if you have union together, you still can only make finite uh, ordinals. Because you need because like for every step you can make you can only make and one other ordinal, basically. You can't make you can't do infinitely many steps. So just with those you don't get infinite on infinite ordinals. Yes. The empty set is equal to the set of all x such that x is not equal to itself. Okay, we need. Okay, we can't do this. Uh, first off, we need comprehension scheme for this, and second off, what you're doing here is uh, unrestricted comprehension, which we're not allowed to do. What we can do once we have comprehension is that we take some set y, which we assume exists, and then say. Uh, the empty set is the set of all elements x in y such that x not equal to x. And that gives you the empty set. But again, we don't even have comprehension yet. We have fucking extensionality and pairing. We, can, we can't make complicated shit like this yet. Can you, can you think of any object which is not equal to itself? No. 
and that's exactly why it gives you the empty set because there is no object that's e that's unequal to itself by reflexivity of equality. There is no this set does not contain any element, which is why it's the empty set. Preposterous, but in this case, the moron orangutans of set theory accept that such a set, as you see here, exists. Okay. Yes. Well, again. That's unrestricted, that's unrestricted comprehension, which isn't allowed, but yes, the empty set exists, and the empty set is equal to itself. It just, every element of the empty set is not equal to itself, because it doesn't have any elements. And it has to exist, because everything else fails, even from the first uh, belief of extensionality. I don't know what that's supposed to mean. Okay, so... Every idiotic set theorist and topologist has... Fucking topologists, dude. Goddamn topologists. ...his own version of what these beliefs mean. And they come in all sorts of shapes and flavors. If you look at this particular video, uh, and I have, uh, I have it over here, this, this guy here who calls himself machine learning god, oh goodness, you know, that. by the way, there is no such thing as AI. Uh, advanced automation is what the idiot programmers call AI. It's not AI and... Artificial intelligence does not exist. There won't be AI for the next, not even 10,000 years, if we're still around, by the way. So, AI is a myth. Now, uh, and of course you've heard of all the authors of deep learning and what have you. It's all a bunch of crap. <laughs> there, there is no AI there. It's advanced automation. And there is a huge difference between that and AI. Again, I won't go into this. Okay, so artificial intelligence is just a uh, catchphrase or a marketing phrase. Now, this guy here in his video on unordered pairs, uh, he talks a load of crap, but it's kind of funny why he says this set does not contain el any elements and it's called the empty set. Then according to the axiom of extension, which is supposedly the first axiom, there is only one such set. But if you'll notice, when he tries to uh, justify that, he goes to the axiom of specification, which is really... Yes, the axiom of specification or comprehension, which is actually an axiom scheme, not one axiom, but that's whatever. That's needed to define the empty set, which you haven't even had yet this axiom here, the axiom of subset. Sure. <laughs> and he has to do that uh, because he, he, he uses... He yes, uses you need that to define the empty set. Is it as uh, support for this false belief too? No, it has, no the, the empty set has nothing to do with pairing. Why? <laughs> pairing has nothing to do with that. Pairing just means you can put two sets in another set. And ironically, it comes after two. So you, 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 this is not only circular, but you have to... It's not circular! Yeah. Pairing doesn't reference the empty set. The ZFC axioms are not only circular, but you have to believe that uh, subsequent decrees exist so that you can justify the knowledge of, for example, previous decrees. So it goes... I don't know what that means. ...to this decree here to show that... that the... Uh, Unordered pairs is a subset, okay? <laughs> that the unordered pairs is a subset? No. 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 What he's starting doing is that the empty set is a subset of every set, which has nothing to do with pairing again. To show that the, the empty set is a subset of every set, I'm sorry. And, of course, yes. you can use unordered pairs to create all sets from the empty set. No, you cannot. You cannot. Pairing does not give you every set that the rest of ZFC can. At the very least, if you have... I mean, yeah. You can't, you can't even... Like, you can't make... Whatever. It does not... Oops. It at least doesn't let you prove that you get it to get shit. You can't even prove that you get the empty set. And you can't create... And if you have a finite set, you cannot make infinite sets with it. Other sets, unless you've shown that the empty set exists. Yes, which he has, with an axiom that you haven't introduced yet. With so an axiom scheme. Belief is something that you have to accept. Okay. Yes, the axioms, you have to accept them. Okay. On faith, of course. Sure. All right. 
And now, by the way, there are millions of... Oh, I just got a new subscriber. Never mind. Okay, I'm just growing in subscribers. But you can look at you these two uh, videos that I've created here. The one's called ZFC Actions or Beliefs, and the other one is a foundation of mathematics on not set theory or ZFC. And they both cover uh, a lot of details that I'm actually omitting from this video. But there's just simply too much crap for me to cover in one video. So I'm covering these beliefs separately. Now, while this uh, definition here is obvious nonsense, some... It's not nonsense. Set theory diehards die will attempt to define the empty set as follows. Like, I don't. That seems like a really weird definition for the empty set. Because you have to. I. That's like it's like it'd be really weird to first somehow construct the natural numbers, and then define the empty set from that. Like the the most canonical definition of the natural numbers. That I know that formalized in set theory or in ZFC, I suppose, uses the empty set. Of course, you can define the natural numbers without using the empty set specifically, but it seems like a really weird way to, to like define it if you haven't talked about it yet. That, right? So, what that says is the empty set is a set of all x such that if x is an element of the natural numbers, x is less than zero and of course <laughs> again by the way this needs comprehension scheme and like union so we can define the natural numbers so we still don't even have those there's no natural number which is less than zero so that set has to be empty and maybe yeah. replacement i don't know you may probably think, not well, well, what's maybe i don't that? know it seems perfectly logical right Hmm, not actually so, because the immediate problem with this bullshit is that it assumes the set of natural numbers already exists. Which we need the axiom of infinity for, that's correct, I forgot to mention that. Obviously we need the axiom of infinity for the natural numbers. Um, and again, that's in ZFC and you just haven't introduced them yet. And that is... False. There is no set of natural numbers. Well, because actually there is because CFC says that there is ex very explicitly. There is no such uh, thing as an infinite set. Actually there is because CFC says that pretty explicitly. There are many other syphilitic definitions. All of them are wrong. And this is... Definition. He really likes to call definitions wrong. In his opinion, you have to prove definitions. I'm going to not go into that required to believe in this action now every Tom Dick and Moore <laughs> has his own ideas and it doesn't matter how many websites you visit how many uh, professors articles or lectures you read they're all non-standard in other words they do not have standard symbolism they do not have standard ideas they've just basically interpreted these nine beliefs as they please and what's wrong with that after all their beliefs right <laughs> that's really too funny so for example uh, that well-known crank mark two carol of good math bad math actually his blog is really bad math bad math <laughs> but he thinks that the ordered pair i love to talk so that one can have cartesian ordered pairs mm. well i hear star trek music playing when i read his blog it's unbelievable crap i don't know uh, what his problem with that is but uh, it suffices to know that the second belief is simply a decree, just like the first, which cannot be true according to the non-existent definition of set. That has nothing to do with that. So if you recall an old video of mine, I showed you that there is no formal definition of set. And I've placed the links in here. You can hit the pause button and go to these links to watch my previous videos. Okay, so I hope you've enjoyed this second in the series of the nine beliefs. I have. It will start to get even more interesting as we hit the remaining seven beliefs. Uh, of course, there are nine because I include the so-called axiom of choice. Mm -hmm. It's actually the belief of choice. Okay. Uh, set theory is unbelievable rot. <laughs> and it shouldn't be used for anything, not for machine learning, not for advanced automation, it should not be used anywhere. 
And if it is, you are guaranteed to find uh, contradictions, paradoxes, and problems. So what is the real foundation of mathematics? It's actually Euclid's elements. And in his five common notions, Euclid uh, succinctly states what uh, the foundations of mathematics are. And that is really what we should be focused on. One second. Okay, I'm back. Uh, you have joined me making fun of a math crank. Focusing and on a very funny the one. The bullshit of topology or set theory. Dude, fucking yeah. topology. <laughs> I love that he just to seems to really hate no topology. Bullshit. Now, um, I'll continue the series. In yeah, okay. So, next up he talks about comprehension scheme, I think. Welcome to my Let me just make sure that he does. I am John Gabriel, and in the third of the series, the ZFC uh, Nine Beliefs, I'm going to be showing you how easy it is to break the axiom or the so-called belief of subsets. Okay, yeah. He talks about comprehension scheme next, um, or specification or subsets or whatever you want to call it. Um, comprehension scheme says that Basically, what it says, what it like, what you should try to interpret interpret it as, is that um, if you already have a set and you have a formula ranging over that set, then you can make a subset of that set that of all the elements that satisfy this formula. So you have a formula phi with three variables among x, z, w1 to w n, and then for every for all of the, like again for all of these sets, there exists an element there exists a set y such that for all x, x is in y if and only if x is in z and phi. Phi I mean well, this is to be interpreted as phi is true for x z w one w n w n. So basically really just means that you have a set z basically let me just put this in open paint again. Okay, you have a set Z, and you can define the set uh, X in Z such that uh, such that phi of X, and you can do that for every formula phi. That's what that axiom says. Axiom scheme. Okay. So without further ado, I'm going to start this. Uh, with some music in the background. It's a very short presentation, so I hope you'll learn something from it. Goodbye. Okay, he doesn't talk in this video for some reason, so I'll just go through it like this. Belief of subset states that if phi is a property with parameter p, again, just gonna have any amount of parameters, it'd have to be one, and it has to be a, a formula, not some property, but that difference is like too specific to explain right now, I suppose, maybe. And for any x and p, there exists the set y u and x such that phi of up contains all those u and x that have the property phi. Sure. That is called the belief of separation or separate belief of comprehension. Sure. Watch how easily it is to break this belief. Let phi be the property that states that a given set has cardinality zero, which is a proper uh, formula. You can do that. Um, noted by parameter z. Well, we haven't defined the empty set yet, but you can define the empty set using comprehension scheme, so that's fine. Uh, phi be the property that states that the set has given. Mm. That a given set is cardinality zero, noted by parameter z. It's not how you use parameters, but 
augmented NZ, noted by parameter NZ. Again, that's not how you use parameters. Parameters are uh, free variables in a formula that you don't really care about. Basically, if, when you have a formula, then a free variable is a variable, variable appearing in the formula that doesn't have a quantifier. For it. So, like, if you look at formula for all x that exists, y such that uh, such that y equals a, then a is a free variable because a is not bound by a quantifier. And parameters are basically quantifiers. To, uh, are basically free variables that you don't really care about, which isn't what he's doing here. But regardless, that's not that's not the main problem here. Um, he says that y u and x such that phi of u z. What he means with that is that such that um, u is as cardinality zero, so that u is the empty set. Now, by definition, y is a subset. Again, yes y is a subset of x, but it turns out that y is itself empty, yes. However, the empty set cannot be a subset of itself. First off, yes, the empty set can be a subset of itself, because every element that's in the empty set is also in the empty set. In particular, every set is a subset of itself. And also, that's not really relevant here, because it only has to be a subset of x. But but again, that seems like really irrelevant. Hence, the third belief fails. And again, I don't see why. Like even, even whether or not you can do this, subsets are still a thing. Speech can be broken in many other ways, but one counter example is sufficient. Good counter example, man. I think that's it. Yeah. It's not mathematics, but mathematics. I like that he calls that a lot. Alright, I think next video is like a real video again. He actually talks. This one's short too, though. Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. And in this particular video, which is called uh, ZFC Actions Belief 4, uh, I debunk the uh, the misnotion that there is a fourth axiom which is in fact the sum or the axiom of sum or the sum of union it doesn't matter what you call it it's nonsense and I'm going to be talking about it now okay axiom of union you have a set A you have a set okay but uh, let's read this again just to make sure I'm not talking I'm not being retarded. Okay, so what it says is that you have, if you have a family of sets, like you have a collection of sets, then you can take the union of all of those sets. And when I say collection of sets, I mean a set of sets, of course. You have a set of sets, then you can take the the union of all of those elements. So. Um, we have a collection of sets that exists. This this element A is going to be the union, such that for every element y, that's an f, and for every element x, that's in sum of those y, and so in one of those y, x is an A. So x is so A is the union of the elements of, of this family f, and that exists. That's the set that exists. That's what that what it says. You can take unions over s sets in sets. Let's begin. So the belief of the sum set states that for any x, and x can be an element or a set, we don't know what the difference is between an element and a set because there is none. Because there is no definition of set yet or element. In and, there, fact, and there won't be one because that's not what ZFC tries to do. ZFC just explains how these things that we call set behave. We haven't even gotten through belief four. Uh, to be able to confirm that our object is a set yet and we've already everything is a set failed on every single so-called axiom 
so for any for any x there exists a set y such that it's equal to the union of x. In other words, the union of all the elements of x. That's the way he wrote this down. This is supposed to be equivalence again. For x, there exists y such that for all u, u is in y if and only if this z is in x and u is in z. Sure. Well, remember once again that the elements of x can, right. be, can be sets or subsets. So this is called the belief of union, and it's written as follows. <clears throat> it's kind of highfalutin here because, <laughs> you know, I mean, for all x there exists a y such that for all u, uh, u in y is equivalent to uh, the fact that a z exists such that z is in x and u is in z. And of course here you've got a lot of interchanging of sets and elements. It doesn't really matter because it's a, uh, it's a bunch of baloney. <laughs> so according to this belief we can define sets as follows. x1 as 1, x2 as 1, 2, and so on. So you This you can do, you can do this with union and pairing and Replacement, like uh, no, not replacement. It was with union and pairing, yeah. You'll notice here that these are the so called natural numbers up to n, right? Sure. Now, this implies that the union of all these sets should be the set of natural numbers. No, it does not mean that. Because the axiom of union um, talks about you have a set and then you have elements of that set, such that and then you can take the unions of all of those elements. These sets exist by union and pairing, but we don't have a set yet that all of these belong to. So, just with this, we cannot this we cannot define this union over these xi because these xi are not already elements of some set. So now we cannot imply the natural num the existence of the natural number set. We need infinity for that. Yes. No. There's uh, no reason to deny that. There's a reason to deny that. Okay, so we have to accept that that union must be the set of natural numbers. If we now start removing all the elements from each set of xi, beginning with x1, then all of those sets that you see here become empty sets, right? I mean, sure, if you remove all of the elements of all of them, then they all become empty. That's trivial, but true. So x1 becomes empty, x2 all the way up to xn, etc. And this implies that the union of the empty sets is equal to the set of natural numbers because... Of course it doesn't imply that. We cannot find the last xi. I don't understand what he's trying to say here. There is no last xi. Sure. If, we, if, we, if you're talking about the original xi, there isn't... If you're talking about these, then like all of them are the same object. So in some sense there is, there, there is a last one, which is any one because it's only this one object. But neither that nor any of this seems to imply that that would make n. Like we, we took all of the elements out. So even if even if we were able to do arbitrary unions, which we aren't, um, then that still wouldn't imply this because we took all the elements out. So obviously the set that like we Take a union over an arbitrary amount of empty sets, which is still going to be an empty set. I think they, that's probably only true with some other axioms. I'm not entirely sure about that. Regardless, we can't, we can't take arbitrary unions in ZFC anyway. Uh, at least not like this. And this last set having to do with anything is not clear to me either. Isn't that correct? No. Of course. So. The union of xi is equal to n, and the union of the empty sets is equal to n, which means that xi must equal to the empty set. No, it doesn't mean that. So even even if this was correct and that was correct somehow, then that still wouldn't imply this because you can have you can have unions of different sets that make up the same union. Like you can have the set one three and the set 2, and take the union of that, that's 1, 2, 3. You can also take the set 1, 2, and the set 3, take the union of that, you also get 1, 2, 3, but none of the uh, 
the sets that were there are the same, so that doesn't imply that either. And that's nonsense because the XIs, uh, before the elements are removed, are not are not empty sets. So uh, this, by the way, is not my proof. It belongs to uh, Professor Wolfgang Muchenheim, uh, who teaches at the University of Augsburg, and. Uh, so this is uh, proof credited to him. He Maybe the proof that that professor said makes a lot more sense, he just misrepresented it. Maybe that proof was bogus too, I don't know. I have, I have no idea. I'm not gonna try to figure out what the original proof was like. Has also been uh, debunking set theory for the last, I don't know, 30 or 15 years, I'm not too sure, it doesn't matter. There are people so who take issue with set theory, those issues are typically more philosophical of nature. I think that's fair, but yeah. So this is what happens when one uses ill-formed concepts such as infinity or the empty set. We, we, we still don't have infinity yet, buddy. We still only add, what are we at right now, union? We still don't have the axiom of infinity. And so it's easy to break every single one of these uh, so-called axioms. They're not axioms, they're nonsense. What this proves to you is that there is no such set as the infinite set or a set of natural numbers. Okay. Again, it doesn't prove that even if, even if all the things you you had said so far were correct, that still doesn't prove that there is no set of natural numbers. It just proves that you cannot. Con it would just prove that you cannot construct it that way. In other words, uh, while there are natural numbers, there is no last one, and it makes no sense to talk about an infinite set. Again, that's so, a reasonable philosophical claim. Join me again in the next video to see how Belief 5 bites the dust. And that's a pretty short one. It's easy to debunk that one. So we'll Don't worry about all these short episodes right now. The last episode is 29 minutes long. <laughs> or 23? Oh, it's only 23. Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel and in uh, this video which is on the ZFC crap axioms belief 5 we debunk the belief of the power set. So let's begin. Now the belief of the power set states that for any x and again we still haven't established whether x is really a set. It is. There exists a set we're again uh, believing that y exists because we haven't even covered the five uh, ZFC axioms yet. There exists a set y equal to p of x and p of x means the power set of x uh, which is really the set of all subsets of x. So you take all the elements or sets or whatever the hell they are of x and you permute them and that's the power set supposedly. Sure, you don't. Per, I mean, permuting, permuting. I'm sure. Whatever. I don't. So I'm not going to pick the language. This belief is written, as you see over there, in that uh, very obfuscated way. It's not obfuscated. It's pretty simple. For every x, there exists a y. Let's say for all y, for all, for all you, you use an element of y, if and only if you use a subset of x. So it's y is the set such that every element of y is a subset of x. So it's a set of subsets of x. Um. Since there is no power set of the empty set, this belief is instantly rejected. Of course there's a power set of empty sets. You just take... First off, um, unless you show that there's a clear contradiction to that existing, you haven't said anything. But all, it, all it says is there exists such a set. And second off, you can, you can even explicitly construct the power set of the empty set, which is the set containing the empty set. What are you going to uh, permute uh, of the uh, empty set? The empty set that has no subsets. It has one subset, but regardless, even if the empty set did not have a subset, then the power set of the empty set would just be the empty set again, which would also not be a contradiction. And then also, since there is no infinite set, because we haven't even reached uh, uh, the belief of infinity yet, which is supposedly axiom 6, the power set of a non-existent set cannot exist. Yes, the power set of a non-existent set doesn't exist either. That's true, it has nothing to do with infinity, and is not a contradiction.
So once again, we see that uh, right up till the fifth so-called axiom, every single one of them fails uh, to confirm to uh, confirm that a given set is actually a set, whatever the hell it is. Join me in the next video to see how I believe six bites the dust. And uh, also, while you're watching these videos, mm -hmm. please uh, go to Math World and look at the corresponding statements. Uh, I think okay, Math World is a reasonably reliable site. Mountain, yeah. Don't believe a word of what your moron professors tell you. <laughs> They're orangutans, and uh, they've never understood set theory. In fact, they've never understood mathematics, much less... Uh, anything else um, take them to task uh, don't let them pull the wool over your eyes mm -hmm. they're a bunch of incorrigible morons and I'll have you know that all the incorrigible that's nice this bullshit started in France with the Bourbaki group, fucking France uh, a group of 40 <laughs> morons the majority of them uh, knew nothing about mathematics and they decided they were going to reinvent the foundations which were already established over 2,300 years ago by Euclid. Uh, the foundations of mathematics are Euclid's elements, not the bullshit of set theory or ZFC axioms. Okay? So, okay. Uh, join me again next time for Believe 6. This is a new calculus channel. I don't know enough about Euclid's elements to make any comment on that claim. Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel, and in this video today, I'm going to be discussing the ZFC so-called axiom 6, which is the axiom of infinity. So let's begin. Now, what is that? Yeah, okay. Um, axiom of infinity says basically just what it says here. There's a set such that the empty set is an element, or a set S, such that the element, such that the empty set is an element of S, and for every element in S, the successor of that element is an S, where the successor is defined as the, the element union, the element, the set that contains that element. So, the set of, like you have, it's called, it's called the empty set zero, because that's usually how you do it. You have zero, and then the successor of that is the, is the set um, of the empty set, union, the set containing the empty set, so we now have the set containing the empty set, and then the successor of that is, this, it's called that one, the root one is the element that contains the empty set, and then the successor of that is the net set itself, so it contains the empty set, which is, which is zero, and then the one, and then the, and then one itself, so we have zero and one, and then again, from here on, we take the successor that contains all the elements of 1, so all the elements of 2, which are 0 and 1, and then the element 2 itself, so we have 0, 1, and 2, and we call it element 3, and so on, and with that, with that we get the successor elements, and then the axiom of infinity claim says that there is an element containing, uh, there is a set containing all of these, all of these things that you can give with uh, by basically just using these successor um, functions, which is which ends up being the natural numbers, because you have like for every natural number, it's also a way to define it is for every element you have this successor function that you define a bit differently, and then natural numbers is such a set that for every element the successor function is also in that set. Axiom supposedly axiom state. It's not really an axiom. It's nonsense, but it states the following. The belief of infinity that an infinite set exists. And the belief is written as follows. Now, that's quite a mouthful, a mouthful of rubbish. And the way to read it is as follows. There exists a set S, presumably infinite by the way, such that the empty set is an element of S, and for any X, whether it's a set or an element, we still don't know yet, in S, the... It's a set, which is also an element, because they are not distinguishable in ZFC. ...union of it with any other set X is also in S. Now... No, that's not what it says. For any X, the union of it with the set containing 
itself, not the union with any other set. That's not what it says. That would again give you the universal set, which is not what it says. You take x and you take the union with the set containing x. Remember that the purpose of these so-called axioms is to establish whether or not a given set is actually a set. It's meant sort of. ZFC can prove that certain things are sets, where is a set means it exists. And you can, that's not that wrong, I got, it's not necessarily wrong the way you said it. How do we do this? By conformance to all ZFC axioms. Sure. Um, that is required so that our object qualifies as a set. Well, I mean, you don't need to use all of them. In fact, you cannot use all of them. Because to prove that something exists, you have to prove it in finitely many steps. But ZFC has infinitely many axioms. But that's the technicality. Because there is no Regardless, you, you don't have to use all of the axioms. You can, you, you can always incorporate the other axioms into a proof and just do nothing with them, but you don't need to always use all the axioms to prove that something exists. Of a set. There's not even a definition of the epsilon or membership relation. Sure. In fact, it's not even called a membership relation. I mean, it's sometimes okay, called since that. The previous five axioms have failed, we are done. Well, there is no such thing as infinity, and I talk about it in this video of mine here. Infinity is an ill form. Again, that's a philosophical complaint, which I'm not going to disagree with particularly. Concept. If you watch this video, you will know that infinity is bogus, that there is no such thing as potential or actual infinity. <coughs> Excuse me. So, <clears throat> um, <clears throat> we can just dismiss this axiom as garbage and you know one might expect some semblance of order and logic and a systematic way which prioritizes these requirements so that it is possible to establish a given object is a set yes if you define something well if you if you're able to define it in zfc then it's a set now this url here is uh, URL to a video by Professor Frederick Schuler, who is a set theorist. And if you start watching from three, uh, three minutes and 29 seconds, you'll see that there is no definition of set, not even of the primary relation E, okay, which is supposedly a membership operator. So you can put uh, two operands on either side and you have a set theory statement. Yes, Ironically, you can do that. The axiom of foundational regularity, which is belief 8, requires an epsilon minimal element, and that comes... I got into that in Honest Video about 8. This is true. I mean, it, yes, I, I got into that then. It's only after this. So the idea behind all this, this bullshit is to establish a set by conformance to the nine beliefs. And so far, every single one of them have failed. Sure. Now... In his lecture, Schuller states that set theory built on the postulate, okay, that's neither here nor there, by the way, it's a guess, sure. that there is a fundamental relation called epsilon. So, set theory is built on this bullshit. There will be no definition. Pay attention, you morons. There will be no definition of what epsilon is or of what a set is, okay? <laughs> you get it? No definition of either. Yes. The way you determine what an object, whether an object or not is a set, is by conformance to the crappy ZFC beliefs that come out of this bullshitology, okay? So, Fucking bullshitology. Instead, nine axioms that speak of epsilon and sets, you see? Instead, this is how you're going to realize what is a set or or an element, or any of these other things. Mm -hmm. So, <clears throat> the relation E is really just a predicate of what he calls two variables or operands, all right? And you can go to his video, which is this one here, and watch it. It's called Actions of Set Theory, Lecture 2, 
by Frederick Schuler. He's an idiot. Okay. Now, you can watch it. He's an idiot. In my next video, to see how Belief 7 bites the dust. You know, what has really stunned me throughout my life is that these uh, incorrigible morons, especially the ones who supposedly put together these foundations, the Bourbaki group in France, fucking France, could actually have uh, called this the foundation, the new foundations. These beliefs are so broken. And in order to make them work, well, they never work. But in order to give them a semblance of logic or some semblance of rationality, one has to produce decrees. In other words, rules or laws as you go along. Because if you don't do that, the whole theory collapses. So, for example, you can't uh, say that the empty set is contained in a set. It you can't say that. can only be a subset of other sets. It, and it can both be an element or a subset. In fact, it's a subset of every set. Then, ironically, when these morons try to derive the concept of number, they do exactly that. In other words, they contradict themselves by including the empty set as an element. Of course, no one knows what the hell an element or a set is because it's not... An element is a set such that... An element is a set X such that it exists in Y such that X is in Y, which means every set is an element. Defined in formal set theory. So, in naive set theory, I don't know if I pronounced that correctly, but I don't give a damn. Naive. Uh, it's, uh, it's assumed that a set is like a container or an empty brown paper bag and that elements are things that you put inside but if you look at it that way it breaks even faster so yes naive set theory breaks which is why people strive to get a better um rigorous definition or rigorous formulation of set theory which zfc is one of so these orangutans had to produce these nine beliefs, which I also think of as decrees. I mean, who the hell are these fucking morons that I should accept, I who am a genius, <laughs> to accept their syphilitic ideas and thoughts? Neither should you, if you have any brains. Okay. Reject this bullshit. It's full of errors. It is full of flaws. It takes years to be able to use, even in a simple way, I mean, I, you can go to a, a site like Psy.math to see how many morons there are still fumbling and bumbling, professors included, over these supposedly foundational concepts, okay? Okay. It's all garbage. Well, <coughs> I hope you'll join me in the next episode where sure I will. discuss uh, the, the last uh, three beliefs seven eight and nine so until next time okay i think for seven i have to explain some shit like actually explain some shit now that of just what i've been doing welcome to my new calculus channel my name is john gabriel and in this seventh video i discuss the crap axiom belief seven okay replacement i think and this is Belief 7 was really established because the mainstream morons... Okay, well, I'll explain what replacement is first. Uh, where is it here? Replacement scheme. Okay. Basically, what um, replacement says is that if you have formulas that are, in a sense, similar to functions... Like function, okay. So a function is defined as a... A function on a set A into a set B is defined as a certain subset of A cross B. I don't know how to pronounce that in English. Of A cross B that has like certain properties. For every element in A, there exists exactly one element in B such that A comma B is in that function. That's the definition of a function. Now, you can talk about formulas. And formula, formulas can have similar properties as function. You can say... Um, I have a formula of two free variables, x and y, such that for every x, there exists exactly one y, such that this formula is satisfied. And in that sense, you can kind of... And... Okay. 
So if you had, for example, you have formula in x, y, such that for every element x in some set, and you have you have sets a and b, and you have that for every element x and a, you have exactly one element y and b, such that phi of x, y satisfied. If you have that, then you can define a function um, from from a to b by with this formula, which you can do with like comprehension and shit. That gives the definition of function. Now, what replacement says is that even if you don't have set B where where you are, um, where your where your where your formula is basically like defining function into, you can create the range of a function and have that be a set. So what it says is that you have a formula phi with three variables among x, y, a, and then parameters. And you get that um, for all like for all its elements, if if in for every x and a you have exactly one y such that phi is satisfied, um, then there exists a set y um, which is going to be a range of the function, which is does this one there exists a set y, um, such that for every x and a there also exists a y in y such that phi is satisfied. Basically, you take you have for every x and a you have like some you have exactly one y um, that so some exactly one set y such that phi of x y is satisfied. Then you can take um, the, the and you can take the collection of all of those y, such that there's an x, that phi of x, y, and that is going to be a set. It basically means you can define you can define a function that way and you get the range of that function as a set. That's what um, replacement scheme says. Basically, you can define functions with formulas and the range of that function is going to be an actual set. But, but... I have not defined what a function is yet. You need replacement. I think you need replacement to actually define what a function is. But all it says is that you have formulas that behave sort of similar to functions. Like in that for every x there's exactly one y such as the formula of x, y is satisfied. And then the collection of y's such that for, for the x in A, 5x, y is satisfied. That is a set. I have the axiom does not reference functions, and I do believe you need replacement scheme to define what a function actually is. To formally define function, so let's begin. Now I am not. This is not homework. Jesus Christ! This is so far. If this was my homework, dude, life would be so easy. The belief of replacement, which is the seventh belief, states that if f is a function, well, this is kind of circular because they're trying to define a function in terms of sets, but already it's a function. So what is a function if you have... And this is where he... This is where he goes wrong. He says that replacement needs functions to exist, which it doesn't, which I first explained. Um, I can guess that uh, he thinks that because sometimes replacement is said as when you have a class defining function which isn't a function in terms of ZFC it's basically what I've described with the formula stuff which basically gives you like a function like it gives you a function in the in the intuitive sense of what a function is supposed to do but it doesn't give you a set in ZFC, that's a function. I haven't yet come to Belief 7. You know, circularity is a key feature of the syphilitic mainstream brains, okay? Everything in their uh, knowledge and theory is circular. Circular reasoning works because circular reasoning works, according to the morons. 
So if f is a function, whatever the hell the function is, then for any x, there exists a set y equal to... Now suddenly we, we're supposed to understand that f takes a set as an input, okay? And basically f of x exists for every x in the set x, right? The belief is written as follows, and I'm not even going to try and read that. Maybe if you did try to read it, you would notice that there is no function in this. This does not reference function. This looks longer than what I've described, but it's the same. This thing just means that the that the, the y is unique, and then we get the same thing. It's just total crap. Except that I am going to tell you that it is required in mainstream theory in order to formally define function, which, by the That's way... That's correct. You need this to define functions. At least I don't know how else to do it. But this does not use function in its formulation. It needs to be defined because the word function here is used. Yeah, but here it isn't. In this, in this, which is the formal formulation of the axiom scheme, it isn't used. And uh, even if somebody tries to retort that this is what it means, well... No, this is not what it means. This, this, this here is what it means. This doesn't mean anything if yes. f isn't a function. Correct. Okay. So, words are required to explain the meaning of symbols, you fucking morons, okay? <laughs> it's not, it's good practice to use words to describe it, but formally it is not needed, no. It's, excuse my language, but I get so worked up with these idiot set theorists and topologists. And <laughs> the fucking topologists! <laughs> professors who've got bird brains, not, not even a... A brain bigger than the size of a pea and you tell these morons that you cannot have this concept because it is ill-formed but they've never understood what it means for a concept to be well formed well in any case they wanted to have a mapping between sets yeah so <laughs> this here is really good is some kind lays a groundwork for mappings from domain to range mm -hmm. That's uh, true. For example, and then you can have statements such as these. And then he comes up with that. Let me move the mouse away, please. For example, D is a domain of all X such that X can you, belongs okay, to Okay, wait, X. let me do this so I can... Okay. So, this has nothing to do with replacement. What he's doing... First of all, what he's doing here, again, is unrestricted, unrestricted comprehension, which isn't allowed in ZFC. You can't just say X such that x is an r, x, you have to be x in some other set, such that x is an r. But regardless of whether you're allowed to do this, this is just r. You're just writing down the real numbers. You, you, you establish a set of real numbers, and then you're just writing down, again, the set of real numbers. There's no... You're just saying... Like... What? <laughs> There's nothing to do with replacement. Uh, for example, and then you can have statements such as these. For example, D is a domain of all X such that X belongs to R. However, there's a problem here because R is supposedly the set of real numbers. Oh shit, here, here we go. So first off, if R, even, even if we needed replacement for that to work for some reason, if R isn't the set, then replacement couldn't do that, but that doesn't, that's not an argument against replacement working, that's just... Like, replacement doesn't say it, you can do this if R doesn't exist. And there is no valid construction of real numbers. Real numbers do not exist. Um, in fact, most, all, not most, all mainstream academics I've met have never understood the concept of number because they fail to understand Euclid and what Euclid had written down. A number... He's going to go on a rant now, and I'm just going to let him talk for a while, and then I'll, like, summarize it a little bit, basically. It describes the measure of a magnitude. A number is the measure of a magnitude or a size. Nothing else is correct, okay? So, some moron might retort that a function cannot be defined everywhere unless R exists, but that's totally false, because... Okay, that is actually false. 
there are many magnitudes that can't be measured. Example, pi, e, and square root 2. <laughs> square root 2 is not only algebraic, it's even constructible. And in one of my world-famous articles where I describe the myth of the real number line, you'll see that pi and e cannot be reified on the number line. Because in order to reify uh, a point, you need not only to be able to construct the distance, uh, but also to calibrate the point on the number line. And writing down pi or e, neither of those are numbers. Those are symbols for magnitudes, not symbols for numbers. And I've produced many videos along this line, so I yes, suggest yes. to go back and watch my videos because they are filled with wisdom. And you will learn more from me than you will learn from all the morons that came before me, okay? Mm -hmm. I know more than anybody else about mathematics. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that sounds cranky, but in my case, I am the exception. It's true. So I've often wondered why the idiots don't just write, if they're so uh, anal retentive, why don't they just write X is an element of M, where M stands for the set of all magnitudes or sizes? Well, probably because, you know, it, it didn't satisfy that their anal retentiveness. And... In fact, there is no need whatsoever for... I hope that he satisfies my anal retentiveness. ...for any of this mental masturbation. It is ill-formed rot and completely unnecessary in mathematics. Not required for the foundations, which are Euclid's elements. So... Okay. So basically, as you've heard, he has... He's very specific about, like semantics of words and in his opinion number has a very specific meaning well in, in in his mind that meaning is specific he thinks that number means measure of magnitude and when he says measure of magnitude he means a rational number it means he means exactly rational number um, and the reason he always says that the real numbers don't exist is because not because like he doesn't accept that you can just define that thing and then just give it some name he is very hung up on the real numbers not existing because they are not numbers because numbers in his mind are exactly rational numbers so because re the real numbers are not rational numbers they don't exist that's basically his thinking ZFC is really a bunch of ill-conceived ideas and so far I've covered seven of the nine beliefs and there are two left and today I've done three videos which is quite a record and the reason for that is that I'm feeling good but I'll try to get the other two yeah I mean like Euclid is his role model has like insane role model and Euclid didn't like rational numbers very much out as soon as possible and to show you that they supposedly fail. all the axioms the so-called axioms fail from the very first one and unless you accept rules and decrees which have no place in mathematics oh yeah that's another that's another thing only logic and sound facts have place in mathematics unless you accept these beliefs you cannot uh, accept modern foundations which are he rejects axiomatic mathematics but again that's a philosophical issue and I'm not gonna go into that set theory and the ZFC axioms well I really wish I could have done nah, that. you didn't you didn't miss it yet we've got like half left because the last video is 24 minutes long in a more relaxed and civil way but I'm so sick of this nonsense and it has to go it may not go in my time but I know it's going to go because this is not mathematics this is nonsense uh, George Cantor is or was the father of all mathematical cranks and you know those idiots who uh, ordained this to be the foundations the Bourbaki group in France they should all have been taken out and shot one by one, in fact. Jesus Christ! This is just absolute... <laughs>
<laughs> George Kent, the uh, French topologists. Uh, from becoming mathematicians. And you can't... Um, okay, I can summarize it really quick. Um, the axiom of extensionality... Oh, what was the argument? So, okay. I don't remember... Okay. So, he, sa he thinks that the axiom of extensionality means that equality is transitive. And somehow that's a contradiction. He thinks that the axiom of pairing gives you the empty set and infinite sets, and that you can build every set from the empty set using just pairing. Um, specific uh, comprehension scheme, what did you say about that? He didn't say much about comprehension scheme. He... Yeah, yeah, okay. So comprehension scheme, he defined the the empty set somewhat wrongly, but he defined the empty set, and then said that the empty set cannot be a subset of another set. So that so that and because of that, comprehension scheme is wrong. Union, he said, union again, he said is wrong because union lets you construct the set of natural numbers, but then. He said you can also construct the natural numbers by taking union over the empty sets. And that clearly can't be the case. I don't know where he got that from. Um, replacement, he said, gives you the set of... Okay, so he said replacement is circular because in the definition of replacement, you use functions, but you use replacement to define functions, which isn't true because you don't actually... Um, use functions of formulation and yeah there were, and then it also gives you the real numbers which he doesn't like I think that's it oh and infinity he says is wrong because he doesn't believe in infinity basically I understand it because it's incomprehensible rot that's all there is to it well I hope to complete the next two uh, videos very soon and Subscribe to my channel, download the most important mathematics book ever written, which will be in the link. In okay, the detail. whatever. Next up is Foundation. Foundation is the most complicated video, I think, and it's only one minute long. <laughs> I think this one he doesn't talk again, yeah. So, the usual formulation or foundation that I know is that every set has an element which is this joint from the set itself. Just put that up. Uh, or every non-empty set, of course. Advanced aliens might already know about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He thinks that um, he made the first rigorous formulation of calculus. And he generally thinks himself a genius. So yeah, um, foundation, if you have a, a non-empty set, then there's an element of x such that an element y of x such that y and x are disjoint. The belief of foundation or regularity states that every non-empty set has an epsilon minimum element. Um, and then he writes the thing that I wrote. This whole thing about epsilon minimum elements is fairly complicated, so um, Having an epsilon, a set having an epsilon minimal element means that it has an element which. Okay. So a set X having an epsilon minimal element Y means that there is no element Z in X such that Z is an element of Y. And, and that's, this has been a bit for me. If I do remember correctly, this is equivalent to foundation because the well, the well founded sets are indeed. Uh, every every uh, every well-founded set, which are all the sets according to foundation, has an epsilon minimum element. So that part's correct. And then he writes on this. We does for all s if s is not empty. This implies that there exists some x in s such that the intersection of the element x with the universal set s is empty. S is not a universal set, but I guess that's just uh, naming again. And that is x is an element of x, s, so s cannot be empty. That's not the point that this is trying to get across. Uh, s is non-empty 
by by this by proposition by I don't know how to say it in English. Um, however, there is no clue what such an X might be. That part is correct. Foundation does not tell you which element of S is disjoint from S. That that part's true. And then <laughs> and then it gets really good. Perhaps the ghost element set smiley face. Thus, we are asked to believe on face faith that there is a minimal element in every non-empty set called epsilon. What's up? No. <laughs> the fucking ghost element is pretty great. Um, the epsilon minimal element is not called epsilon or the membership membership minimal element. It's not called epsilon. <laughs> it's just some element. This is very obfuscated way of saying that S has no element set. No, that is not at all what that says. What it says, having an epsilon min or a membership membership minimal element means first of the thing I defined, and then sort of more strongly that um, basically, basically with foundation. Again, I don't, I don't actually know if this is equivalent, but I know that foundation implies the existence of epsilon minimal elements. Um, but basically what you can get is, you can like construct upwards, sort of, um, all the elements. Um, you start from the end set, and you take like the power set, and you t always you take the union over the power sets and that together, and stuff like that. And again, I don't want to go too much into that. It's also been too long. Um, and then having the absolute minimal elements basically means that you can basically define a rank operation for every set that gives you basically in simplified ways how many steps you have to take to get an element like that and then you can take any you can offer set you can take uh, an element of minimal rank which is an ordinal so this exists and then that set is Epsilon minimal or membership minimal. This doesn't no. This has nothing to do with saying that S has no element set. Um, S being non-empty is the condition that we need for this to even make sense because otherwise it can't have an it can't have a disjoint element because it doesn't have any elements. This this axiom does not try to say that there are that there that there is an empty set. It's definitely not an obfuscated way to say to say that it's definitely not an obfuscated way to say that S has no element. It has an element. This belief is intended also to shore up support for the empty set itself. No. That is, even the empty set has the minimal uh, membership relation, whatever the hell that relation might be. No. You specifically said that if S is not the empty set, then that holds. Membership has no definition but morphs into membership. Epsilon has no definition but morphs into membership when it is used with two variables on either side. Chuckle. It sure. Now if you were stupid enough to believe all this rot, this is your chance to redeem yourself. Set theory is a canker. It has no place and is not required in mathematics or any other rational field of thought. Do not for one moment think that any set theory has been used in STEM. Set theorists would like you to believe the contrary so that they continue to have subjectivity. Again, this is something that I have that I don't feel qualified talking about, so I'm not gonna talk about that. And he talks about Euclid again. Okay. I'm gonna go to the bathroom real quick and then I'll tackle the last minute last video, which is twenty four minutes long.
Okay, I should, I should be back. I just have to find my... Uh, one second, I'm gonna be back. <laughs> So, next video is going to be about the axiom of choice. Um, the axiom of choice, the formulation that I'm going to use for, to present first, is that every set of which all the elements are not the empty set, there exists a function, I should probably put this up, there exists a function on x into the union of x, such that for every element of x, f maps a, maps that element into itself. Okay, with that in mind, stop watching this video. And this is gonna be this is gonna take not only long because of the video, but also because I have to do something for this. Welcome to my new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel, and in this final video regarding the ZFC axioms or beliefs, rather. I will be discussing the so-called axiom of choice. Now this one is the big one and I must <clears throat> tell you that this is not an axiom. It's, it's not even a logical belief in fact, but at any rate uh, without further ado let me start talking about it. And this is going to be uh, a slightly longer presentation because uh, there is so much more to cover. So let's begin. Now, <clears throat> as you've seen in the past uh, videos, I've explained to you how you can break every single one of the ZFC actions because they're not really actions, they're beliefs. And uh, you'll also note that in uh, axiom or belief six, I uh, showed you how there is no definition of set or element. Uh, there never is any definition, but one determines whether a given object is a set or an element using the ZFC beliefs. That's pretty okay. correct. So now... <laughs> okay, I want to pause this here. And I watched this the first time. I looked at this and it was like, what the fuck is even happening with this? So, for all x and a, so we assume there's, there's some log as a, there exists, and then he says, a of x, y. And I was, I had no idea what, what, what this was supposed to mean. This was, I thought this was clearly some non-standard syntax. And I tried to figure it out for a bit, but I couldn't figure it out, so I let him talk about it for a bit. The, the belief of choice states that every family of non-empty sets has a choice function. Well, what, what it really states is... That's the thing that I said, yeah? ...is that you can pick an element out of any non-empty set. It doesn't say that you can only take an element out of a non-empty set. You can take an element out of each set for any set of sets, which is much, much, much stronger. Okay. In other words, you can just close your eyes and pick an element, provided the elements are well formed. Okay. That's the whole idea behind this axiom of choice. Uh, uh, the idiot Zermelo was attempting to do a lot more than just uh, what he did in the axiom of replacement where he uh, put together the decrees and rules for functions and mapping. So, I mean, you can't have, you can't have choice without replacement because in your placement to define functions. But so <clears throat> what he wanted to do was make sure that you could map an infinite At least not as far as I know. set which Maybe you doesn't can. exist to another infinite set. Okay. Which really means that if you have... Okay. That's not what it means at all. This does not have anything to do with existence of mappings between infinite sets. The existence of mapping between infinite sets, you can already define... As soon as you have infinite sets, you can already define functions that map... Like, you can define 
the function that goes from the natural numbers to the natural numbers and puts each element to itself. That's always something you can do and you don't need choice for that. That you could map an infinite set which doesn't exist to another infinite set, okay? Which really means that if you have a curve, like let's say y is equal to 1, in other words, you want to be able to, he wanted to be able to say that this line here is continuous and is defined. Oh yeah, this is something I forgot to mention. Eh, it's, it's fine. For every mapping. However, um, Again, I don't know what he means with that, though. While you may turn around and say that's true, it's not actually true if you're talking about mapping of numbers. It's true if you're mapping distances, okay? So, in other words, if you're talking about distances along the x-axis... And here he's talking about um, that thing from earlier, where only rational numbers are numbers, and everything else is like a magnitude or a distance. No problem. You can map that distance to one. But not every one of these distances has a number that describes it. Okay, in other words, there are many magnitudes on this line here which are incommensurable. It, what that means is they have no measure. Which, with that he means they're irrational. But what Zermelo wanted to ensure, and the idiots of the last 100 years in the mainstream, is that you could literally map any of these so-called points to some other point. Not you don't need choice for that. You can construct the real numbers without choice, and you can take the function that he wants here that maps every real number to one. You don't need choice for that. Not even necessarily a line, but a curve of any particular structure or a surface, right? So, uh, the belief is written, as you see here, for all x is an element of little a, presuming, <laughs> you know, uh, little a is a set, w which means that there exists a function a, which takes uh, sets x and y, and you have the implication which appears to the okay. right of this arrow, okay, so this... Okay, it doesn't explain any more than this. So now he says that A is supposed to be a function of X and Y. So then I tried to figure out what this means in that context, and it still didn't make sense, because here it has this. So then I thought about it a little bit more, and I figured, okay, based on what says here, A must be a formula. But then this doesn't make sense, because ZFC can't talk about formulas. Then I thought about it a bit more, and what I eventually figured... If, um, he means is that for or what this is supposed to mean is that for every x and a there exists a y such that a of x y then and then this this makes sense then there exists a y such that for then there exists a function y this function now this would be a function such that for all x and a a of x y of x holds and I believe that that is indeed equivalent to choice the, to the to the formulation with the function that maps each set into itself. Um, this is this obviously okay. So this is not one axiom. This would be an axiom scheme for every formula A. This would be one axiom, and this would clearly imply the other formulation of choice by just setting uh, A equals or A is uh, y is an element of x, and there exists a function y, such that for every element x, uh, y, of, y of x is an element of x. That would imply choice. Um, I was able to, sh I think, that I was able to show that, uh, let me just do this really quick, so I don't actually show something. I do think I was able to show that the other implication also holds. I assuming I didn't make a was it assuming I didn't make a mistake. Let me see if I have this right here. This this and it's this. Okay. Uh, 
Um, it's kind of bad. I, I typed this out in Discord while I was talking to Sami. Basically, I think that it's equivalent by um, if you have the other formulation of choice, and you have your you have your formula A, then what you do basically is you define the set which you can do um, for every x and x. You define the tuples x and y such that five x five x y holds. Um, the empty set is not an element of A because for every um, x and x there is such a y by assumption on on a and i would assume um i assume that well i don't really assume this this this, this here there exists a y such an a of x y which is what i'm assuming this is supposed to say um then by your formulation of choice you can find a function of a into union a such that f of x an element of x for every x um and we know by how this is defined that f of x is an element of x um, if and only if phi of x y holds where y is the second component of x of, of x where y is the second component of f of x because f of x here maps into pairs and then you can define the function from x into or oh, well add this as phi I was confused uh, phi is the fun is the formula and a is the is this is the set of course I was confused because a was the, the, the formula in his video and you can define the function that goes from x into this into this set and that puts um, every x into this uh, into this set of the pairs x y set of five of x y which is why I needed the pairs so that I can uniquely represent these there's a fun it's also a projection but the projection isn't necessarily it's a function and then you can define the function um, that puts that then like you have the function f, which the, which you get with choice, and you can just define the composition of those, and then phi of x x uh, h x holds by by that argument. So if I didn't make a mistake, like that these my interpretation of what this is supposed to say is indeed equivalent to choice. This belief is really just a stronger version of belief six. Belief six is replacement. This is clearly not just a stronger version of belief six. Um, or is it? Let me, let me just think about this. So the, the, the normal formulation clearly isn't because it uses functions or relations or orderings. Um, would this, would this formulation imply replacement? I can't imagine that it does. But if I assume I didn't make a mistake with that being equivalent to choice, x and a, x is y, x y, then x is y. No, this doesn't. This doesn't. I don't think that this. Uh, wait. This is unique. No, 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 no. No, this, this clear, clear, clearly, this still uses functions. What, what? Uh, this still needs replacement to even make sense because it still uses functions. What replacement says is you can, you can basically define ranges of quote unquote functions that are given by formulas, and what this says is that you can gain functions that have certain properties, which is just like a different thing. The belief of replacement. Belief six wants you to think that sets can be mapped in a systematic way with discrete elements. How no, that does not mean that this belief six, which is replacement, does allow you to define functions, but it doesn't say anything about discreteness or like systematic ways. However, Belief 9 wants you to think that sets can be mapped even with continuous elements. Which, I don't, again, I don't know where he's getting that from, so it's hard to refute. Like, it doesn't, it just doesn't say that. In other words, you have a real number line, which is bullshit. There is no such thing as a real number line. And you can map those numbers, okay? So, 
you cannot choose an element unless you know what it is. Well, you can even choose infinitely many elements by invoking choice. Choice says that you can do that. So what do I mean by that? Okay, so supposing I tell you to choose a number, to choose an element between the open, it, to choose an element from the open interval 3, 4. Okay, 3.5. The, the open interval 3, 4 is really just this interval as follows. Um, in other words, I just want to reduce this so I can show you exactly what I'm talking about. Uh, all right, so here we are. So if we have three and four, so in other words, I want you to pick an element between between these two points here, okay? So between, be, let me just move this out of the way, between this point here and this point here, okay? Now, by the way, I'm going to add uh, an extra uh, requirement. You cannot pick a rational number. So in other okay, words, take Python. Words, I'm removing all the rational numbers from this interval. So you can't turn around and say, oh yeah, just divide that interval by two. No, I'm sorry. I want you to give me an element inside here, which you can choose. So now the first element uh, that might come to your mind is your so-called irrational number pi. Dang, you got me. A number of any sort. It's a magnitude which is incommensurable. So then I'll tell you, okay, well, show me where is that magnitude. It's like about here, roughly. Like, nah, it's more like, like about here. Pi. So you go in, you, you do something like this. You go x is equal to pi, right? Like that. <laughs> yeah, like about and that. And then suddenly you have this line here, which presumably goes through pi. The problem is... It doesn't actually go through by. It goes through some rational. All of this has nothing to do with choice, by the way. Approximation of pi. All right. It even goes through some finitistic, or some finite approximation of pi. So uh, we can expand this, and let's do that like so. So, and and, and I can prove to you that even if I say x is equal to 3.14159, like that, you won't be able to see the difference between that line and the other one. And I can also break this line up as follows. I can make it like that. And so the red line over here, I can make that thick. This. So, okay. So you can see that it doesn't matter what particular uh, rational number I choose, if it's close enough to the rational approximation that the software uses, then you're not going to be able to distinguish between the lines, no matter sure. how much you how much you open up these intervals, okay? No sure, matter. if you take a rational approximation that's closer than the, than the machine accuracy, then we can indeed not in this program distinguish them. But first off, that doesn't mean that they're the same number. And second off, it still has something to do with choice. No matter how much you stretch these intervals, you're not going to be able to differentiate between the two, right? Sure. This is basically equal to pi, but this number here is, is not the same as pi. So if I had to say, see that? So in this case here, I said the number here is a line i then this is approximation. Mm -hmm. So even neither of these numbers is pi, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And in fact, the distance from the origin to this point here, from the origin zero to that point, mm -hmm. is really a magnitude. It's not a number. Sure. But now, the idea behind the axiom of choice is that you can actually pick out irrational numbers, so to speak. There aren't any, but you can actually pick out one. The problem with the axiom of choice is that you cannot choose an element unless you know what it is. Well, you can. You can even do this without choice sometimes. Okay. So, as I've just given you an example, if you retort pi is such an element, well, it's not, because 
you can't pick it out because you don't know uh, what it is. Well, I do know what it is. It's the first zero of sign that is greater than zero. So you can't just say, oh, yeah. That's it's a mag perfectly fine definition. Magnitude. That's nonsense. A number describes the magnitude. And you can't call the magnitude an element because you have no name uh, in terms of a number. In other words... I do have a name. Pi. A real number line is a myth. There's no way you can calibrate pi. Even if you can mark it off, presumably on the line, there's no number to describe that magnitude. Well, pi is that number. And this is where the delusional Zermelo redemption belief comes in, the axiom of choice. The redemption belief. That is, as long as there is some sort of function that generates the digits of pi, then you should pretend that you have actually chosen pi. Again, no. Choice says that in certain situations, there are functions that do things. If you already have a function that gives you all the digits of pi, and you already know what pi is, you don't need choice for that. Did you, did you get that? So in other words, if there's a function uh, like a Taylor series or something, or anything else that produces pi, you can presume or pretend that you have actually chosen pi. The fact is that at no time can you recognize any of the elements which you imagine to be irrational numbers. I can imagine it. You don't know what, you don't know what my imagination is. Yeah. There are not numbers at all. So a magnitude is not a number, and a number describes the measure of a magnitude. So the only numbers in the universe are rational numbers. There are no other numbers. But these morons of the last 150 years in the mainstream have tried to cons produce valid constructions of real number, but none of them are valid. Dedekind construction is not valid, neither is Cauchy equivalence classes. Why not? And there is, neither is Eudoxus, by the way. Some more. I don't actually know what Eudoxus is. Psi.math uh, seems to think that Eudoxus formed a uh, valid construction of real number, but that's never happened. I'll tell you this, uh, not even God can measure those magnitudes known as pi and square root 2 and e. I... S yes, again, I'm not going to go That's into philosophy right, right now. Even the gods can do that. So, you might look at the graph of a function and imagine that it is complete. However, you will be wrong if you think it is. This is a weird claim. So, if only the rationals exist, then obviously it's not complete in the metric sense because the rationals aren't complete. Um, but I... So, if he says that, then yes, that's correct. Um, but I don't think that he means completeness in the metric sense. I think he means complete as in without holes, in a sense. And that's weir a weird topic, because you can say, in a way... If you're, not, if you're not talking about metric completion, um, then the rational numbers don't really have holes in them any more than the real numbers do, because between, between the, the rational numbers are dense in itself, so between any two rational numbers, there's another rational number. And of course you can fit the irrational numbers into them, but in the same way, you can you fit other numbers into the real numbers. And again, I'm not going to talk too much about that, because that's, again, something I don't feel qualified talking about, because I don't have any experience working with hyper-real numbers. But I think that, that statement just seemed weird. Of course, you could just be talking about metric completion, but I don't think he knows what that is. In other words, if you look at this, uh, this solid, this is supposedly a solid line, but... Uh, the well, software. this line just has finitely many elements, so it has a lot of gaps. It doesn't actually uh, print that line entirely as you think it does by plotting pixels. It doesn't print it that way. Well, and it actually does print it by plotting pixels. Even the hardware doesn't illuminate the screen at every uh, possible point on the line. It's only pixels of a given size. And, and so, in reality, if you could see very well, you would see holes in this particular line, as you would see on any graph. 
Maybe. Simply because uh, the software tries to show you that the line is continuous and not broken, but it is broken in terms of the se- of the in terms of the sense that numbers are not available to describe every one of these points. Okay, only magnitudes. Okay, so <coughs> excuse me. <clears throat> so while any distance can be mapped to any other distance it's not so easy to map an incommensurable magnitude. I wonder what he thinks distances are. Like, where does it... I think he accepts constructible numbers as uh, distances, so, like, numbers that you can get by um, adjoining square roots to Q. I would imagine he probably thinks... Hmm. I wonder if he thinks algebraic numbers in general. Uh, bad. Uh, corner distances. Maybe he just thinks all real numbers are distances. Who knows? And mapping distances without measure is decidedly not the same as mapping numbers. And of course, as I've just said, no computer software or graphics software yeah, that's pretty good. uses anything but rational numbers, okay? I remember in the old days, back in 1980, if you wanted to put anything on the screen, whether it be a pixel or a number, you needed to know the hardware screen address and then raise the signal by outing uh, the correct value to that port. So if I remember correctly, for a color screen, it was 0B800 hex. That was the address of the screen. Okay. I'll check that. I should check that out. Was it 0800B? I don't care, actually. Okay. So at any rate, you never, ever draw a complete curve. It only appears to be complete because of the way it is being done by the software. Yes, so, there are only finitely many pixels on the screen. The line 3.14159 and x is equal to pi will be indistinguishable and you can only scale up to a certain point. So um, no software actually draws continuous curves even though they mm-hmm. appear to be. So in fact, uh, what is the crunch of belief 9? It's simply this. The so-called real number continuum requires belief 9. It does not. You can construct the real numbers without invoking choice. I don't give a crap what anybody who came before me supposedly proved. Not what Gödel proved or... Fucking Gödel. Again, Gödel has very little to do with this. (laughs) Cohen, who won the fields, medal prize sometime in the last century... Those guys were both idiots, okay? Really, the ZSC axioms uh, require the axiom of choice. No. I mean, yes. I mean, yes, ZFC axioms require axioms of choice, otherwise it's not the ZFC axioms, otherwise it's just the ZF axioms. Otherwise, you know, their supposed uh, set of beliefs isn't complete. (laughs) So... They're all nonsense, by the way. They're all rules that they've made. And in mathematics, there are no rules. There There are no no rules. Logic and rational thought. You don't get to say, oh, well, in this case, uh, every set contains a subset and you expect everybody to believe you. That's bullshit, okay? I mean, you could probably somehow make a set theory where every set has to contain a subset of itself. I mean, you could... You can definitely make a set theory like that. You can probably you can probably even make a consistent theory of that. To prove these things. And there is no proof. That's why these orangutans of the mainstream decreed that... There's indeed no proof that in ZFC every set contains a subset of itself as an element. Because that's wrong. <laughs> From henceforth, those beliefs will be axioms. In other words, an axiom is something that can't necessarily be proved. So from these myths and misguided ideas come the mainstream understanding of number. You know the the real number line? There is no real number line. There, It's possible to construct a rational number line, but beyond that, 
you can't have anything. So without belief six, there is no well ordering. And without correct belief nine, there is no continuing. There's no, no continuum. Wrong. All right. So no continuum without belief nine. The foundations of mathematics are Euclid's elements, not the rot of set theory and ZFC crap axioms, a bunch of ill-conceived ideas. Now, just to finish us off, I want to show you that even... Now it gets juicy. Up till today, uh, mainstream academics don't know what the hell they're talking about. So, if you go to a site like Reddit, you'll see... Uh, this topic being discussed. So somebody says here, suppose you have a bunch of boxes with random stuff in them. Anyway, I'm not going to read the whole thing out. <laughs> you can read it yourself. Hit the pause button and read it. Or go to the URL, which is right up top there. And then read some of the uh, responses. Okay. And I think this one that was made two year, two, about five years ago is really classic. <laughs> So let's read through this together. It says mathematicians, I call them mathematicians, a few hundred years ago, were trying to put together the rules to explain what is a set and what it does and how you can manipulate it, right? At first, it looked pretty easy. A set is a collection of objects. You can do things like take the union and put them you know, into a bijection or collect the sets and that, dissect them. And it, it doesn't say anything of that here. It just says union and intersection. Whatever. Um, take their intersection or the power set of a set, which is a set of all subsets of the original set, etc., etc. So all of these ideas, which were the first notions of set theory, did not work. And so... Yes, that's correct. That's why... That's why they needed a better formulation. He says, yeah, oh, that's right. You can also have sets of sets <laughs> and sets which are elements and elements which are sets. Mm -hmm. And sets can be described by a rule, <laughs> notices, by a rule rather than needing to list out all the elements. That's, uh, the, that's the essence of the axiom of replacement. No, that's the essence of the axiom scheme of comprehension. Which is belief six. Which is not belief six. Okay, so you can have, uh, you know, a set which is described, as you see here, the set of all x such that x is an even integer greater than zero. And again, we're still talking about naive set theory right now, but this is this is not allowed. This the way he's written there is not allowed in uh, in ZFC because we need we need a base set first. But that's nonsense that's that doesn't describe the whole set that just describes a particular part of the set or how to generate the set it describes the whole set it has exactly all those elements in it that are even integers and anything that isn't an even integer is not in the set it perfectly describes the set but you cannot generate the entire set because there is no such thing as an infinite set so you can't just say two, four, six, dot, 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 and say that's an infinite set. That's not an infinite set. That's a finite set with three elements and an ellipsis. Okay? <laughs> I love that he says it like that. But you can also have uh, a finite set of real numbers. And it says now, and if you got really tricksy, I don't know what that word means, but anyway, you could make a set contain itself. Did you get that? You could make a set contain itself. Don't ask me how. But anyway. Again, this is the naive set theory. Like maybe the set of all sets. It's a set itself, so it must be able to contain itself, right? <laughs> That's, uh, I believe, the mainstream theory that sets contain themselves. Dude, you just, you just had a nine... You just had a nine video presentation about, Z about ZFC. No. The common, in the most common set theory, which is ZFC, I think, sets do not contain themselves. He's talking about this person, this commenter, is talking about naive set theory. And he's go they're going to lead that to a problem. That's bullshit. Yes, it's bullshit. That's why we didn't do that in ZFC. And then, according to Bertrand Russell, uh, 
who came along and said that the set of all sets that do not contain themselves is a set and asked whether it contained itself or not. So what you'll have is an infinite recursion. And there's, there's obviously no answer to that because it's nonsense. Uh -huh. And that's why we needed ZFC. Um, it leads to... Or something else anyway. The conclusion that if a set contains itself, then it shouldn't contain itself. And if it doesn't contain itself, then it should. So in other words, it's nonsense. And here comes the crunch point. It says, so the only possible conclusion was that it wasn't a proper set. Well, listen to me, you morons. It's either a set or it isn't. Yes. And they're saying it isn't a set. There is nothing else. Yes, exactly. There's nothing else. That's the fucking thing you failed to understand this whole time. In, ZF in ZFC, something either is a set or it doesn't exist. In between, okay? <laughs> There's no such thing as a proper set or not a proper set. It's either a set or it isn't a set. Yes. Get it? Yes. And that meant that something was wrong with the way that sets was being defined. Yes. You don't say. Yes, and that's why they made CFC. <laughs> <laughs> well, <clears throat> the idiots have never rigorized uh, the found their foundations of mathematics, by the way. You can break every single one of their so-called axioms. They're not axioms, they're beliefs. And it's easy to make up theory which is going to be paradoxical and contradictory when you base it on beliefs, things that you assume to be true, but you cannot prove to be true, uh, such as infinity, okay? So, um, and if you read through this thread here, it, it's kind of amusing because a lot of them don't know what they're talking about. Some of them know a little bit, some of them have read a lot and Reddit is basically a very crap site, but it's sometimes amusing to visit. Same. So anyway, uh, this idiot says, that said, to this day, no evidence of its inconsistency has been found. You see, now, this guy here is obviously a brainwashed moron, all right? He doesn't know what the hell he's talking about. Now, uh, and if you go to... Wikipedia, I'm sure that guy is a French apologist. Peter, you'll see that Cohen showed that the continuum hypothesis cannot be proven from the... Zermula fractal actions with choice. Now, I don't really care what it says there, whether it can be proven or not. To me, that statement there is not proof of anything. And the fact that he received... I mean, yes, that statement is not a proof of anything. The proof that he gave is proof of something. A Fields Medal just tells me that the orangutans in the mainstream church of academia simply awarded him a medal because they felt that what he uh, supposedly proved was worth something. I don't feel... Yeah, they, they probably thought that was pretty good. I don't think, in fact, I know that whatever Cohen proved wasn't worth anything. And the same goes for Gödel, who supposedly showed that CH cannot be disproved from ZF. Okay even if the axiom of choice is adopted. So at any rate, uh, and the chief crank behind all this is, was the father of all mathematical cranks, George Cantor. See, you can't have things like Aleph zero and Aleph one and Aleph null without the axiom of choice. In other words, without the belief of choice. So Cantor, is really the root evil of all of this. Um, there is no such thing as different level of infinities. There aren't even real numbers, but the morons of mainstream academia haven't realized these things because they were not able to understand Euclid's elements. All right? So all right. in Euclid's elements, we find the foundations of mathematics. And there was no need to recreate the foundations. If they had understood the original foundations, in fact, the provable foundations, because there are no axioms in Euclid's elements, by the way. In Greek geometry, in fact, in geometry, there are no axioms. There is this bullshit about the fifth uh, postulate. There, there are no postulates. You can derive 
parallel lines systematically from nothing. Okay, so you start. If you would like to see him derive the five postulates from nothing, he has a video series on that. I'm not going to cover that. Start <laughs> off with an empty universe, then a point, as I've shown in several of my videos and articles that I've written. Uh, there are no axioms or postulates in sound mathematics because rules and decrees and faith and belief have no place in mathematics. Well, <clears throat> this has been a rather long presentation. And I'm out of breath now, so I guess it's time to stop. This is a new calculus channel. My name is John Gabriel. Till next time, goodbye. Like, he believes in non-Euclidean geometry, man. Alright, that was the thing. Uh, I mean, it's not just that he believes that the, fi the fifth one can be derived from the other four. He thinks that you start with nothing and you can derive all five. That's what he thinks. Okay, that was pretty fun. It took about as long as I expected. I was expecting it to take about two to three hours and it took two and a half hours. That's nice. Um, if you wanna, if you want more of this, you can subscribe to him. He uploads like pretty often, maybe like once a week. He has a lot of good shit. <laughs>